All right, so let's just wait for those few more minutes. And then... Oh, yeah, that's fine, because I think when Lorenzo does it, I don't think... Can two people do it? I think it's just one. It's yeah, it's one person just recorded, does it. Right? Oh, really? I, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know where it saves to. No, but... it's going to, to my computer. Yeah, okay. it will just save to his computer. Yeah. Uh, right. We'll start letting people in. Let's 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 start. Let, okay, yeah, let, let's let's start letting people in. All right. Cool. We can just keep talking, so it's not like awkward. Yeah. 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 I mean, everyone's in. Well, coming in. Can everyone hear us? Can someone just unmute your mic? Yeah, I see people saying they can hear us. That's great news. <laughs> All right. We'll just wait and see a couple more minutes just before we begin. Yeah. Um, this way, everyone who wants to make it will make it. Yeah. We'll start at five past, so about a minute and a half. Yeah. Sorry for making you wait this time, but in just one more minute, I'd say, and then we can get started. Yeah. That's fine. So in the meantime, um, I'll just send to the, um, to the to the chat here on Zoom the link to join our Slack workspace. And this way, if you haven't done it yet, you can do that. It's going to be quite a useful tool if you'd like to use it to discuss among yourself and also for the speakers that have agreed to do so. You can also ask questions on there after the Q&A is over and um, they'll try to answer them when they can. So I'll just send the, yeah, send the link now on, on here. Right, uh, I think we'll start. So, yeah. so hi everyone. Um, my name is Shiresh and I am the president of the UCL Physics Society. Uh, I just wanted to start by giving you all a very warm welcome to this year's rather unusual uh, inter-university conference. Um, this year we are joined by Imperial Physics Society and also the Oxford Physics Society. And we have two professors from each of our respective universities and they're all giving uh, talks based on the theme of beyond the standard model physics, which I'm sure you all agree is a very interesting topic. Uh, finally, just for me, I would just like to say a big thank you to uh, Lorenzo and Zara, uh, the two UCL academic officers uh, for working so well and effectively to organize this year's conference, despite the circumstances. And uh, hopefully you all enjoy it as much as you would in an in-person setting and gain a great deal of knowledge from the bright minds of our speakers uh, over the next two days. Uh, all that's left for me to say is thank you for being here. And I will now hand over to Bill Gessu and Amelia uh, for them to formally introduce yourselves. Uh, Bilgesu, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Bilgesu. I'm the Physics Society President at Imperial College London. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, this conference was, uh, it was something we've been working on for a while now um, with, with Oxford and UCL Physics Societies. And um, it's really a pleasure to have um, an event where we can uh, welcome, um, you know, students from all of our societies and I'd highly encourage you to use the Slack server not only to interact with the speakers but also amongst yourself. Uh, I suppose that's really the best uh, we have in terms of um, you know modeling what it would be like a real life conference in terms of interaction with uh, with other attendees and uh, I'm sure some really nice discussion will, will uh, you know happen there as well so I'd encourage you to uh, you know share your ideas with everybody. And thank you all for coming here. Uh, I'd like to thank Logan, uh, our educational lecturers officer, who's, who's done an excellent job um, 
keeping in touch with our speakers. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all of our collaborators from uh, UCL and Oxford who've, who've made this possible today. Uh, Amelia? Yes, hi, I'm Amelia. I'm the president of Oxford Physics Society. Um, so for us, this conference um, would have been a train, a train ride away from where we were in a normal year. Um, so this is our first year participating. Um, so I'm really glad that um, Imperial and UCL have invited us. So thank you, Sharish and Bilgisu. Um, in our case, um, our secretary, Tasman, has done a wonderful job inviting um, amazing speakers, but I'm really excited that we also get to see now speakers from other universities. Um, it's great to see such a big audience um, for our very first time uh, joining this conference, and I'm hoping that we'll find ways to keep collaborating um, even in the future when in events are in person again. Well, yep. Thank you so much, Amelia, Lugas, and Shrek for this great introduction to the conference. And I am Lorenzo, the UCL, one of the UCL academic officers, and I have the pleasure today to introduce the first speaker that will open our conference is Professor John Butterworth. He teaches and researches at UCL. He's active in researching high energy physics, and particularly he works on ATLAS, the main experiment at the CERN Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Among other things, he's worked on supersymmetry, vector boson scattering, and Higgs physics, and many other topics which he'll talk about um, today. He is also the author of the widely used Rivet Library for Programming for High Energy Physics. And now, just before we start with the conference, just some housekeeping things. So I will shortly send the program for this conference on the Slack workspace. This way you can, we will be able to see what's going to happen in these two days that are ahead of us. And this li the link to join the Slack workspace, if you haven't joined it yet, is right now in the, um, in the Zoom chat. Other than that, just Please keep your microphones off and your cameras on if you are able to do so. And of course, after the, the speaker has finished his talk, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. So with that said, I'm, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Butterworth and Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lorenzo and everyone. And, and it's really nice that you've organized this event and thank you for the invitation. I should maybe, sorry, Lorenzo, but I should probably start with an apology to my Oxford and Imperial colleagues. Atlas isn't, I, I think Atlas is the main experiment at the LHC, but the CMS experiment and the LHCB are also pretty impressive and Oxford and Imperial are on them. So I'd better be polite there at least. But, but, but it's, they're, they're certainly Atlas and CMS were the two big general purpose detectors. Um, that were involved in the Higgs discovery, part of which I will talk about um, in the next half an hour or so. Um, and uh, LHCB is involved in studying flavor physics, and I think you have some talks on that later in the in the in the meeting as well. So it should all be covered um, there anyway. Um, right. So I'm going to try and share my slides because I do have some slides, of course, um, and they're in PowerPoint. So let's see if I can manage to make the full screen thing work there as well. Can you see my slides now properly? Yes, perfectly. Very good, thank you very much. Right, so yeah, I, I, I've, um, I'm gonna give a fairly, I, it's really nice that this, the focus of this topic is on beyond the standard model physics. Um, and that reflects a kind of journey that, that my own research has gone on a little bit in that most of my career, I worked in Hamburg for a while working on the structure, studying the structure of the proton and um, then joined Atlas at CERN right from before it, it was starting data. So we helped build parts of it at UCL. Um, and what I spent most of my career doing is actually measuring things that actually happen. So scattering processes that because they're real and they happen, they're of course part of the standard model. So what you would call a lot of what I've been doing is standard model physics. I mean, it's been measuring new physics that we didn't know before, but it's all turned out to be in agreement with the standard model. We've been testing the predictions as a standard model. And the way my research has gone now is that we're, we're using those predictions, in fact, to, to look for beyond the standard model physics. There's a kind of parallel track where you go and look for the beyond the standard model physics directly from the beginning, which many of my colleagues work on. And, and that's also implicit in some of the heavy flavor and the dark matter searches that I think you'll be hearing about in this conference. Um, but I, I particularly like the, this approach that, that we've been following because you 
you you measure you make precision measurements of real things not just theoretical ideas but then you confront them with the theoretical ideas of course and that's where the, the physics really happens and i've actually even written a, a book for the general reader about this and the, you'll see various illustrations in there because i think of it as exploring a, a kind of landscape of subatomic physics of particle physics and it's in in surveying that landscape that we're really testing our ideas about how the universe actually works so you'll see appearing in this talk every now and then little bits of maps um that that compass thing is there is is one of them um which i hope is a useful analogy from this kind of overview if you like of which i hope sets the the scene for the rest of your your talks in fact at some level and the talk is called off the map because um what i'm going to be giving you is the news from the energy frontier which is of course where atlas and cms are operating at the moment um but again for most of my career we've had a very clear map of what we should be doing from the theory we've been told you know we were told the top quote should exist the neutrino oscillations have to be sorted out um the and then the higgs boson should be there and, and if any of those things hadn't been true the standard model well the standard model was changed because of neutrino oscillations and if the top and the higgs hadn't been there it would have been changed even more radically um but now those things have all at some level been done and we're we're kind of exploring off the known map at the moment and i think that's a very exciting place to be so Particle physics is the study of fundamental particles, as you know, um, and the first one of those to be discovered, which it would, I guess maybe the first thing to say is, what do we mean by fundamental? The, what we mean is it's a particle that is, um, as far as we know, um, isn't made of anything else. And in the end, the set of fundamental particles then that we find are the ones that everything else is made of. And the first of these to be discovered was discovered in Cambridge, actually, by J.J. Thomson. Um, this is his uh, experiment, a little bit smaller than the, the Large Hadron Collider. It's actually just a vacuum tube with a cathode and an anode. And these cathode rays were the kind of, I guess, the, the, the dark matter of the time. They were like, what, what is this stuff um, that, that's coming off when you heat a um a cathode and, and apply an electron and, and and apply a field in a vacuum and of course thompson by applying various um electro electric and magnetic fields which were you know the cutting edge of the time uh, more than 100 years ago now satisfied himself and then the rest of the world that that these were um, particles that there was all whatever you did it was always the same particle and it's of course the electron and that particle is kind of the gateway to subatomic physics um and it's uh as far as for more than 100 years now more or less we've been trying to break the electron we're trying to see if it's got any internal structure or any even any finite size and we haven't found anything so as far as we know and according to the standard model the electron is a fundamental particle it's infinitely small it's point like um and and manipulating and studying electrons allows you to essentially explore the whole of atomic physics um and you get into the world of quantum mechanics then of course and you get this correspondence between waves and particles which brings with it a correspondence between energy and resolution which you'll be familiar with from most of your courses i'm sure but it's a very key idea in this idea of exploring why the high energy frontier is interesting and what it means to be exploring it so what I've shown you here is an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum. I forget what the what the molecule is that's doing the emission spectrum. It's one. It's a fairly modern fluorescent light, um, although they're all being replaced by LEDs now, of course. But um, the one on the bottom, the absorption spectrum, is actually the sun. Uh, it's the it's the um, spectrum of sunlight, and the lines, the absorption lines in there, are the different elements in the sun's atmosphere. And the reason I'm showing you this is not really particle physics; it's atomic physics or maybe astrophysics, but it's the fact that these um, the energy levels in an atom, of course, correspond to the wavelength of emitted photons, and that that wavelength of, of the photon, of course, determines the smallest thing you can see with a photon. So you can't resolve anything smaller than the wavelength of the thing you see. And then, if you think, well, okay, um, if I want a short wavelength photon to study matter at the at the um, at the smallest distance scales to see what the, the fundamental particles of nature really are to maybe see if there's even more fundamental particles inside the electron say then i need a very short wavelength and then of course i immediately know that i need very high energy okay so that's really what drives this exploration that's what we're not just colliding particles together at super high energies because we can we're doing it because it's essentially building us the most high resolution microscope we can possibly build to study the internal structure of, of matter and, and to see what its fundamental constituents are. 
so on these maps, the conceit of these maps really is that everyday life is kind of in the West. And, and as you go further and further East, the structure of, of fundamental particles of the standard model is revealed. Um, you look inside the atom, of course, of the Rutherford scattering experiments, you see the nucleus. You look inside the nucleus with higher energy particles, you see protons and neutrons. You look inside those, you start seeing the quarks and, and the gluons that hold them together. Um, and all of that is, is increasing energy and increasing resolution along with it. And that's why that's how this structure gets revealed to us. So as we went further east, we, we mapped out this, this landscape here and in, in, in the conceit again of this map, the forces are the things that communicate with, with, between these different structural levels, of course. Um, but you'll see that on the, on the bottom right there, so in the, in the far, um, I guess, um, near the equator, but in, on the, um, in the far east, there's this fairly, fairly blurry island, which is where a lot of the forces are actually originating from. You see the W and the Z and the photon and the gluon, which um, is where the bosons live, if you like, bosonia. Um, and that's deeply connected with the map that we had before we built the LHC, so the latest fundamental particle. And we knew there was something weird going on on the edge of this island because the energy scale, just to go back here, the, the kind of latitude of that island um, where you see the W plus, W minus and the Z, all clustered there corresponds to a particular energy scale and we knew there was something interesting happening at that energy scale this is a um a cross-section plot um from the experiment that was in the tunnel that the large hadron collider is in now but before so this started actually started taking data just about when i started doing my phd or my dphil actually i was in oxford at the time and um and it, it what it is is the map of the z boson it's setting the um the, uh, the, the energy scale of um, 90 GeV is a key energy scale corresponding to the mass of the Z boson. And what this is, what you're seeing here along the horizontal axis is the, um, the central mass energy. Um, the vertical axis is a cross section, which is essentially proportional to the number of times a given thing happens, a given collision. And the collisions that were happening here were the electro was electrons colliding with positrons, the anti antiparticle of the electron, and annihilating. And what you see, that huge peak right in the middle of the plot there is, is a resonance, of course, and it, it's when you can create a Z boson with the correct mass. And you suddenly get this, this um, resonant phenomenon and enhancement in the cross section at that value. And um, that set, that, that's some key energy scale going on in nature there. That's, that doesn't look very normal, right? Most cross sections are expected to kind of fall as, the, as you go as you go up in energy because things are getting smaller and they're harder to hit but today suddenly you have this notable feature in nature perhaps an even more dramatic way of, of seeing this um, when you understand the plot is this one this is actually a plot from the experiment i did my doctorate on um, and again you've got energy in fact this time you've got energy squared on the horizontal axis on a log scale this time and what's been shown here is the cross section um, of electrons scattering off protons. So we were using um, electron proton collisions to study the internal structure of the proton um, and to look at the quarks inside and actually at least potentially discover, uh, see whether there's internal structures of the quarks or not. And you know that there, there isn't, otherwise you'd have heard of it. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, and so what, what you have there, the blue line is when a photon is exchanged um, in the kind of diagram you have on the top right there. And that's an electromagnetic interaction and it's it happens quite often and as you go up in energy the cross section drops um, and the electron just scatters smashes the proton to pieces and um and you measure the scattered electron the red line though is is different the red line is when a w boson is exchanged it's a weak interaction and you can see that it's um several orders of magnitude less likely to happen than the electromagnetic and that's why we call the force the weak force because it, it's much rarer it's much it's much weaker um but as you go up in energy and interesting things happen the two forces come together right so the two cross sections approach and that's telling you the strength of the two forces is, is becoming comparable so once you get to a value of about 10 to the 4 giga electron volts squared they've come together and that 10 to the 4 giga electron volts squared is about 100 GeV which is roughly where the Z boson is as well right it's about 90 the, the Z boson and they're telling you that physics is really changing and, and that's the key energy scale in nature that we call the electroweak symmetry breaking scale there's a there's a um, uh, there's a symmetry in nature that is broken in everyday the everyday world but is restored once you go above about 100 GeV in energy 
and this electromagnetic, the, the weak and the electromagnetic forces come together. And the theory had them gave us this. We had a map from the theory that told us we understand in the in the standard model at least how that must happen. Um, and it was at this key energy scale there. Um, and it's connected with the fact that if the, the symmetry is broken and the and the um, con the, the mechanism by which the symmetry bro is broken implies the existence of, an, of a new particle, the Higgs boson. So this maybe I'll just say a little bit more. I, I've actually lost the time. Lost, lost, I don't want to make I'm not sure I don't overrun. I better not go into it. I can answer questions about why the Higgs and the symmetry breaking are related afterwards, if you like. Um, but the fact is that there's a symmetry broken and the, and a, and a, the consequence of, of breaking that symmetry was the prediction that there should be a Higgs boson in nature, which is a particle unlike any other any of the others on the map so far. And this is a plot from um, March 2012, as, as you can see, which um, after we've been running the LHC for a while. And the nub of this is, is what we're plotting on here is the top mass on the horizontal axis, the W boson mass on the vertical axis. And the reason for the reason for showing this plot is the quantum corrections to both of those tell you where the Higgs boson should be if the standard model is correct. So the top and the W, they're just they were just the two least well known parameters of the standard model at the time. So that's why they're plotted. Um, and the 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 calculations that you do that include the quantum loops that involve the Higgs boson as well tell you that it should be within that little green ellipse. And everything except for the grey lines has already been ruled out. We knew it wasn't there. So you can imagine things were a little tense here because if it didn't show up in that little bit of where the, the gray line intersects with the blue with the green ellipse, then the standard model was essentially wrong. Um, this is March 2012 is, is a key date, of course, because in um, on July the 4th, 2012, we actually finally broke through into this uh, island, this Bosonia, with the Large Hadron Collider. So this is the um the, the classic view from CERN of the uh, the path of the Large Hadron Collider here. I I have to say that I, I do like, I, I apologize to those of you not in London, but um, it's very easy to remember that the the length of the Large Hadron Collider is within the nearest kilometer of the length of the circle line in London. So Imperial and UCL are actually roughly where Atlas and CMS are on the circle line on, on the LHC, which is kind of fitting. And it, it's neat because it's yellow, so it, it's easy to remember because it matches the, the tube map as well. But you can see Atlas pictured there. You can see um, the Lake Geneva in the background and Mont Blanc far on the horizon. We were colliding protons there. This is with each other head on. And this is one of the, again, sort of iconic image of Atlas under construction from back in 2005 now, it's a long time ago. And this is an engineering drawing of Atlas, which is a sort of cylinder detector that surrounds the, um, the collision point. And when you um, make measurements there, you can see things like this. So this is a, the, the, this is a kind of graphic representation of a collision event in Atlas. And the blue lines are charged particles passing through a semiconductor tracker, and they're being bent by a solenoidal field. Um, and so you can measure their energy and their momentum from, from how much they're bent. The green circle there is a calorimeter which traps um, electromagnetic particles and measures their energy, stops them and measures their energy. And the key thing in this picture is the yellow blobs in, in that green um, circle because they're photons, they're very high energy photons. And pairs of photons is one of the ways if you create a Higgs boson, um, it will decay very quickly. And one of the things it will decay very quickly to is a pair of photons. So the reason for showing this picture is that if you can have a detector like Atlas or CMS that can count the pairs of photons and you do a bit of relativistic kinematics and, and calculate the invariant mass, which you know, some of you have been teaching relativistic kinematics to last term. So you, you know how to do this. You, you, calculate, you get the energy and momentum of, of the pairs of photons. You calculate the invariant mass of the pair. Each of the photons will be massless, but the pair together will have a mass and you plot the distribution of those masses. If uh, there's a Higgs boson being created briefly, you'll see a clustering, a bit like the Z boson, you'll see a resonant peak. You should see something like that if the Higgs is created as well. And so that's what we did. You can see the, the on the, the vertical axis is the number of pairs of photons, on the horizontal axis is the mass of the pair of photons calculated from their energies. And you see the date ticking away there. And we've gone past actually now the 4th of July, 2012. 
But if you do a fit to this, you see that there's a significant bump there that you can't describe the data without putting that bump in. I'm going to run it again just because there's a lot going on in this plot. So the, the error bars are just statistical errors. You can see there's all kinds of excursions. You really see this kind of fundamental knowledge that there's a Higgs boson emerging from statistical noise in a, in a really quite a graphic way. The bump itself doesn't look terribly impressive in the end. It's not as clear as a Z boson. It was actually quite hard to find the Higgs, but we've since measured it in many other different processes, different decay channels as well. Um, this was already um, statistically incompatible with the background anyway. So that was um, that was the end of, of, of that work to discover it. And of course, as, as always happens in these cases, the, the theorists got the Nobel Prize for that in 2013, not the experimentalists who actually found it. But there we go. So that was goes from before the LHC to now. And you can see there's this kind of mountain range, which is the energy scale of the um, electric symmetry breaking energy scale. And on the other side of that, once you have access to it from the LHC, then you have um, then you you find the Higgs boson there sitting on the on the kind of east coast of the island. Okay, oops, sorry, my thing froze. But so you might say, well, that's the map finished, and in a way it is. That's the standard model done. But we know that the standard model is not the full story. So the picture I just flashed up there by mistake is one of the things missing from the standard model. This is, of course, that famous image of the black hole at the centre of a relatively nearby galaxy. Um, but the reason I'm showing you is not because black holes are exotic, it's because even gravity isn't in the standard model. So the standard model deals with strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force and electromagnetism, but it can't accommodate gravity. Gravity is sort of the, the stage on which the other forces pay, play. It, it's, you know, it's described by the curvature of space time and general relativity, um, but it's not a quantum field theory. It doesn't fit in the standard model in the same way that the others do. So you could say, well, I don't care about that because we've got general relativity, we've got quantum field theories. They may be incompatible at some super high energy when you get near a black hole or something, but that in everyday life, they're fine. And everyday life extends along, uh, this includes most of astrophysics, for instance, and nuclear and particle physics. So let's not bother about that. But you'd be wrong because um, the, the even astrophysics can't be described um, by a combination of gravity and general relativity because if you start looking, for instance, at the rotational speed of galaxies, then either there isn't enough well, there isn't enough gravitational force to keep them keep the stars bound together and the galaxies bound together at the speed they're rotating. Um, so you have a choice, either your gravitational theory is wrong or there's more matter than you think and that matter isn't in the standard model and I believe the next talk will be all about the dark sector and dark matter and that's something that is clearly beyond the standard model. We also even don't understand why we have the amount of matter we have in the universe. All the forces are, are at least very close to being symmetric between matter and antimatter. Certainly when you create some matter you always create an equal and opposite amount of antimatter. So if that happened in the Big Bang, where did all the antimatter go? Why is the universe not 50-50? Um, again, I think you've got talks coming up that will explain how we're looking at this. But all of these things, oh, and finally also, um, it's not just about going to high energies. The neutrino sector um, has potential to violate this matter-antimatter asymmetry and, and is very poorly known at the moment and is being explored by some major experiments in, um, in the US and Japan principally. So there's a lot still to do both on the map in the kind of the neutrino sector and there's good reason to know that there's some weird stuff going on in the Far East off the map. Um, you can see that the kind of imagination of the theorists um, uh, filling in that gap, but really that is just imagination. The only thing to do is to actually go and find out. So just to wrap up, I hope I'm not massively over time. I will finish quickly. Um, the whole of the last two years, in fact, we had a European strategy for particle physics discussion and there's one going on in the United States right now called the Snowmass Process. This is a picture from the meeting in Granada um, just so in 2019, um, before when we could still travel. Um, we discussed um, how we might extend our knowledge of this map and how far east we might push it. There are ideas to build, um, in fact, the idea that emerged as the highest priority was actually to build an even bigger collider at, at CERN. Um, to explore further east. Essentially, this is our vessel for going, it's our better microscope for looking smaller or it's our vessel for exploring further east. Um, it requires a lot of technology development. I think you're getting a talk from Matthew Wing later about some of the ideas about how you might build better accelerators cheaper um, to get us further east for less resources and be smarter, not just bigger. 
Um, this is a, a, the people building high powered magnets that are needed to bend these high energy particles around the rings. It's one of the limiting factors on the energies we can get to. But I think it's important to finish to emphasize that the um, that we're in a different situation from when we built the LHC. When we built the LHC, we had this clear map that the Higgs boson has to be there, or there are otherwise our ideas about the universe are, are significantly wrong. Now there is no single best theory for beyond the standard model physics. We need a change of approach. Um, we're really, we're not really, in a, in a way from an experimental point of view, this is more exciting. It's not, a, it's really about exploring new physics territory. There are no guarantees. We know dark matter and, and other things beyond the standard model are out there somewhere. Um, we don't know what supersymmetry is, but we know that something explains the observational evidence for dark matter. But there's no guarantee that it will be in reach of whatever ship we can build, whatever collider we can build, whatever experiment we can make. We have to go and measure stuff that no one's measured before and see whether it stacks up with the standard model or whether it gives us clues as to what's beyond it. So this means we need to make and exploit careful theory independent measurements. You can't build the theory too much into your measurement. You have to be kind of theory neutral. Um, on the other hand, you need very, very precise theories that can predict what you should see so that you really learn from the comparisons. So we have a guarantee that we'll find out whether or not the standard model continues to operate at these super high energies that we can get to, first of all, with the LHC upgrades and then maybe with future colliders. Um, that's a guarantee. That's new physics. It's stuff no one ever knew before. There's no guarantee that we will discover dark matter. There's no guarantee that we will even break the standard model. It could be that the standard model operates for orders of magnitude up above where it does. And so for the first time really in my career, the theorists uh, trying to catch up with the experiment rather than the other way around. And we may get lucky, um, we'll see. Uh, it may be that the standard model is isolated. It may be, as I say, that would, the, the one thing that's for sure is if we don't um, look, then we'll never know. Okay, just to finish, I ought to credit Chris Wormall who, who drew these maps um, from, from my imagination basically. Um, and they're in that book, um, uh, uh, but over to you for any questions, I think. Uh, thank you for this talk. It was really very interesting. And we do have several questions, as a matter of fact. I just wanted to remind the attendees that they can either write the question in the chat or, or if they prefer, they can use the recent function and they can just ask the question by their voice. So the first question we have on the chat is by Abhinav Chudri, who asks, why do neutrinos oscillate? They oscillate because um, they, they have mass and actually more, more specifically because their masses are different from each other. So if you think of, um, of, of when you measure a, quant a, a wave function, when you make the measurement of a quantum system, um, you're essentially measuring it against a set of axes, you're, the eigenfunctions or the eigenvalues of, of, um, of various operators and what define how you measure it. And so if, when the uh, neutrinos were thought to be massless, as they originally were in the standard model, the only way you could distinguish the three kinds of neutrino from each other, the only way you could measure them again, the only axes against which you could measure them was the flavor. So whether it was produced with an electron, a muon, or a tau lepton. Um, so that's one way of kind of dividing up a coherent beam of neutrinos is, is that way. However, now that because they have mass, that provides another way. They have three different masses and that provides you with a set of orthogonal eigenvectors that you can measure them against that doesn't line up with the flavors, okay? So it's a bit like polarized light. If you, th if you think of a Polaroid that way, and, you, and, and if, you have, if you have polarized light and, and, you find, and it's polarized this way, a Polaroid will, will be dark because the polarization is wrong. But if you turn it slightly that way, you can regenerate the other polarization. And that's a very close analogy to what's happening with neutrinos. You produce them in a flavor eigenstate, but they travel in a mass eigenstate. And that mass eigenstate is a mixture of flavor eigenstates. And so that's how you get the oscillation going on, if you see what I mean. Right, thank you. And we have a question from Oishi Banerjee. And the question is, the map of the invisible is fascinating. In relation to addressing the issue of combining gravity and the standard model, if the theoretical graviton had to be included in the map, where do you believe it would be and why? Right, um, very good question. Um, I think it, well, it would be very low mass. So in a sense, it should be far out to the West, but also in a sense, so should the photon, to be honest, which I've put up near the Higgs. Um, 
and the reason I've I've put them up there um, is because I think the well the quantum aspects of gravity have to be realized at very high energy. So the fact that we've observed gravitational waves in a, in a way, you know, they they tell us that whatever is propagating the gravitational field is as near massless as makes no difference. So very far, very low energy. Um, but any but they're very classical. They're classical waves. They're classical waves in space time. If you want to see the quantum aspects of them and you want to actually see a quantum of gravitational field, then it has to be very, very far to the east. So I guess the answer is, you know, this, the equator goes all the way around and they're probably at the antipodes on the other side where east and west meet. Right, thank you. And now one more question. We have lots of questions actually. Uh, one by uh, Quentin Lewis who's asking, you said initially the electron has, has been probed enough to know it has to be a point particle. Yet in field theory, it seems that every fundamental particle is a field. Isn't that contradictory? Um, it's contradictory just because of the clumsiness of language. But basically when I say particle, I mean an excitation in a quantum field. So yes, they're all, they're all excitations of quantum fields. And they have, an, because they interact, they have an apparent extent even. So they, they have quantum loops. Um, so if you imagine an electron going along, if you look at it closely enough, you can see that it's emitting photons and then reabsorbing them and stuff. And that gives you a sort of cloud of virtual quantum um, corrections around an electron. But the theory can cope with that. You can calculate that and you can say, OK, is there a point where I push through that cloud and then find that actually there's a, a radius of the electron in there, really a fundamental radius, which does happen with a proton, for instance. You do see a fundamental radius to the proton, but you never do with an electron. Every, as far as we push it, this quantum cloud of, of quantum excitations, it just it, it's just mushy. It just pushes all the way down. So we don't know that it's point like, of course, but we but in the standard model, it is. And, and the best experimental we evidence we've got has not been able to um, uncover any finite extent of the electron. So yeah, particle, particles and waves in the quantum language, they're, they're, they're all excitations in quantum fields. You're absolutely correct. That was very clear. Thank you. And now we have uh, something. Matt Raymond asked to ask a question uh, by voice. So please go ahead. Hi, John. It was a great talk, by the way. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you talk about requiring further approaches to study particle physics. Uh, with the recent push for using AMO techniques, such as measuring uh, fine structure constants or transistors in positronium, or even just the techniques themselves to trap and control uh, atoms to study decays, to, mm -hmm. to then probe the standard model and uh, future, like how it, uh, deviations in standard models can occur. How do you see this changing sort of the kind of experiments that uh, the LHC or the future circular collider does uh, right. like 10, 20 years from now, or even as it's happening now? I, I, think, I think this is a very exciting area um, for many reasons. I'll, I'll give a couple in a minute. I, and you probably, I, I, the, there's a lot of this, I think you're probably working on some of this at UCL and there's also a big, big center being built in Oxford about to work on this as well, I know. Um, I th what's driving this is the fact that we, we, and I think that it's a really good example of fundamental physics coming at you from two sides, actually, because the fact that we can build large scale quantum systems is really exciting um, for, for two reasons. One reason is that actually, I think that some of the issues about gravity and quantum field theory may actually be more fundamental than just going and finding a new particle. It may be that our ideas about quantum field theory have to change fundamentally. And I think studying large scale quantum systems and decoherence and coherence in large scale quantum systems is a really exciting way to start actually doing that, which arguably is more fundamental than what's going on at the LHC, to be honest, because it's, it's really could change our whole view of, of quantum theory in a way. Um, rather than, you know, it's pretty fundamental to be finding the basic constituents and forces of matter, but they're all embedded at the moment in the quantum field theory language. And if you actually change the language as well, then in a way you're, you're, you're doing something even more profound. So I find that really exciting. And to be honest, a lot of our condensed matter and, a and atomic physics colleagues have been doing that fundamental physics, pretending to be doing quantum computing for quite a long time. And I really like the fact that they don't have to pretend to be doing that anymore. They're really doing the fundamental system, uh, fundamental physics of large scale um, quantum systems, which is of course what you need to build a proper quantum computer as well. So they weren't lying, but it's just to my mind, 
the quantum computer is an application of a truly exciting bit of physics rather than the other way around. I also, also because you can build these large systems, they, then you can make incredibly sensitive measurements. And it may be that you can measure gravitational waves or particle properties such as their electric dipole moments or, or rare decays of neutrinos much better this way that can also then reveal beyond the standard model physics. So I, I still think we need the kind of brute force method of turning up the power on the microscope and building and, and doing the high energy collisions, but it's not the only way. And some of these experiments may give us a, a much better motivation of what a target energy for the next collider should be, for instance. That was really exciting to hear. And I guess it's good that they don't have to lie anymore on what you're doing. <laughs> we can actually do. It's not, it's not so much lying, it's spinning. Put yeah, it of course, way. of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, before I address the further questions that are in the chat, I would just like to uh, tell whoever's asking their second question, I will just go through the first question of everybody first. And then if there is time, we'll go through their second question. This way, nobody's left out. Mm -hmm. So we have a question by Abhinath uh, Chudhari was asking, can string theory solve everything? No, <laughs> it, can't solve, it can't solve anything at the moment. Um, no, I mean, it's obviously, it's a, it's a fascinating idea that's, that's led to a lot of really interesting physics and mathematical research, but um, it hasn't solved, it hasn't actually made any proper predictions yet that we can test. So I would say, and it, it, it's been promising for decades, but it, and it's still promising. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying again. I'm not saying it's lying. It may still be right, but it's but it's not a theory of everything at the moment now. All right, thank you. Yeah, I I expected that kind of answer in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so from uh, Nina Dimova, we have for now it seems we're going about learning more the same way as before. High energy collisions. Do you reckon there are other ways to explore new territories? Are there other ideas circulating in the experimental field? Yeah, in a way, this this comes back to Matt's question. So that's certainly the most exciting area. There are other ways for sure. Um, and by the way, even when we're we're doing more high energy, that also drives new technologies and things. So it's not just doing the same thing bigger, although it is bigger. Um, so there's a lot of interesting technology and, and materials physics in, in that as well. Um, in, for instance, high temperature superconductivity will, will be essential to, to build a, a successor to the LHC probably. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think the, the most promising um, area to my mind is, is what Matt was discussing, these large scale quantum systems, very, very sensitive detectors and also studying the fundamentals of quantum mechanics at the same time. Um, also, our, our astrophysics friends have access to some fantastic um, phenomena in the universe out there. It's a bit difficult doing repeatable experiments, but there's some really exciting um, physics that, to be done with, with um, astrophysics observations and, you know, the evidence for dark matter coming from there and, and what, could, what could you learn about dark matter by looking at the cosmic microwave background or the large scale structure of the universe. So there, there are many strands that come together and they're all feeding into this underlying framework of, of how our, this is the nice thing about having an underlying kind of a, a, such a well-established standard model. It allows you to make connections between experiments and observations that, that are not obviously connected, but they are via the theory. And that of course, stress tests the theory and hopefully in the end breaks it and leads to a better one. All right, thanks. Yeah, it sounds like we're going towards a very exciting time for high energy physics research and let's say for physics research in general. Uh, now from Maria Avramidou, she's asking, could there exist a modified general relativity that explains the motion of stars without the need for some dark matter? Yeah, um, I, I, they could, I think. Um, no one's managed to find one yet. There are various attempts around that, that get bits of the observations right and other others not so right. There's definitely a very strong feeling in the astrophysics community that that really is dark matter and that it's, it's quite hard to it feels like you fine tuning any model ridiculously to to try and describe the observations i'm more of a dark matter skeptic than most of my astrophysics colleagues it seems to me that that um we know there's a problem with we know general relativity isn't part of the theory of everything so surely it must be possible to tweak it the problem is that you have to tweak it such that it hardly changes it on the solar system type scales but it changes it on galactic scales 
and that's rather difficult but there are ideas around there are things called in fact on the map in the far east of the map there's a weird one there called chameleon particles um, which are one of these ideas that can explain at least some part of dark energy and dark matter um, by by introducing a fifth force effectively and they don't get you still need dark matter as well to get the astrophysical observations right but they reduce the need for dark matter and maybe those theories can be improved such that in the end you don't need dark matter at all there's some really exciting work going some colleagues at nottingham working on that which is why it made it onto my map because they go they, i saw a seminar at ucl that they did and that's that is an act i'd say it's a minority of people working on that but but they're, they're, some of them are very very good and it is very active so i, I think the jury's still out although if you ask an astrophysicist they'd say of course does that matter <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks and uh, well I, maria also had asked uh, a follow up to this question which i didn't see in the beginning but i think you also answered that one it is what is your personal opinion on the existing modified theories yeah i guess i gave the answer to that already right yeah so it's it's in the same thing and from uh, maggie chen now what are your views um wait a second sorry i lost the question because someone else sent another question okay what are your views on using machine learning in data analysis for particle physics um i think like any subject that has especially now we're experiment led we have more data than we know what to do with at some level if we're not careful so machine learning is a very useful tool if used properly for doing that so I, I, I think I, I think I've discussed this with Maggie actually one to one at some point. Um, but but I, it's absolutely true that machine learning can be really useful in helping us understand our detectors. But the, the issue is always what's the grand truth. So machine learning is very good at reproducibly doing something like recognizing a face or a traffic light or, or, or a, a cancerous, a precancerous cell or something like that, where you you can train it on, on something where you definitely know the answer. And so if you want to train machine learning to find an electron or a muon in your detector, that's great, right? You can do it to do that because you can get a grand truth sample of test, test sample that you can train it on. However, if you want to train it to find beyond the standard model physics, you really don't know what you're doing because you don't have the grand truth to train it on. Now, I'm not saying it can't be useful. It can maybe still be good at anomaly spotting and, you know, say, it maybe it can do the inverse and say everything else looks like the standard model but i don't know what this is over here that could be very helpful but i get i do get worried at some colleagues who are essentially building in too many theoretical assumptions and then training the machine on the theoretical assumptions and in a way you only see what you expect to see if you care, if you do that if you're not careful so i i'm again at some level i have my worries about about everyone jumping on the machine learning bandwagon Nevertheless, it's definitely very powerful for some applications. You just have to choose your application carefully. That, that makes a lot of sense indeed. And uh, from Socrates Mikhail, why is most of the universe made of just the first generation of particles? Um, the smart, yeah, the smart answer here is the second law of thermodynamics, basically. Um, so it sounds a bit odd, but. Um, a heavy particle is a very, very concentrated bit of energy, right? So it will fall apart, just on the, it will it will spread the energy around. The partition function, if you think of statistical mechanics, it will just want to decay. So the default is anything heavy will decay. So the only things that don't decay are the things that are so light they don't have anything to decay into anymore. There's nothing lighter that they can decay into. And you say, well, why doesn't everyone, everything decay to photons? And it doesn't because there are conserved quantum numbers like the electric charge. So they forbid the decay of an electron to say a pair of photons um, so the electron is the lightest charged particle a, a tau is like the electron but heavier so it can decay it can decay to muons or, to, or electrons and the muon is heavier it can decay to electrons the electron has nowhere to go so at some point you everything will decay down because of thermodynamics everything will decay down to the the the, um, the lightest thing it can do which is corresponds to the partition function having everything as energy is why the lowest the yeah the, the highest entropy state basically everything when everything's decayed and um but at some point the conserved quantum numbers stop the decays happening and that's the first generation of particles so that's why that's why everything's made up of all right thank you and from uh Diaco, that asked me in private the question thank you for the talk i have two questions do you think a beyond the standard model theory will have beauty or naturalness if so or not so what do you think so from your experience 
And also, do you think theorists have a good chance of discovering, of discovering beyond standard model, or do you think they have to wait for the experimentalists to shed light? On the last one, I mean, theorists are discovering beyond the standard model stuff all the time. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's all wrong. Um, so no, there are lots of people building models, and I, I think in the end, yeah, we're desperate for experimental evidence. So I, I think, I, probably the most promising theoretical idea that could make a breakthrough actually is if you could find a way of explaining the uh, astrophysical observations without dark matter. To me, that's the most promising way of theory on its own explaining with because you need some weird observation to explain to validate your new theory and to me that's the outstanding one um so but i, I think no i think we need we need more data um from the different sources that we've been talking about already today um uh sorry I've, oh yeah the, will, the, will any new theory be beautiful or, or, or um natural um those are very subjective criteria, um, so I, I get very worried about them. I tend, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it as beauty or, or natural. There's a beauty in, in there's a beauty in a solution, which is is when you when you have many different phenomena and they're all suddenly seen. You see that they're actually different manifestations of a single idea. They're emergent from a single underlying theory. That's that is beautiful. It appeals to to many of us, um, but it's to me it's not an aesthetic thing. It's more like Occam's razor. It's like why, why if you can explain more with less, then you would explain more with less. Why would you invent stuff that you don't need? Um, and to me, that's more important principle than looking for something that's beautiful because beautiful it is really subjective. I mean, you know, and complexity is beautiful. So is simplicity. Which one are you going to choose? You know, I I, I just um I, I tend to think the, the its economy is more important it's explaining more with less to me is the important thing so beyond the standard model theory that just that includes another thousand parameters and, and zillions of extra particles and then in the end you can fit anything with that if you make it up i would like i would like to have a few underlying principles that that make it work again that's only my opinion you know nature may not be kind but to me it's not beauty that should be the driving force but i do think that that simplicity and Occam's razor is a good is a useful principle for trying to stop yourself going down blind alleys, maybe. All right, thank you. And I guess we have maybe the last question I'm going to ask in this Q and A, and then the other ones maybe they can go into Slack, and we'll also transfer some of them to the Slack platform. So that last question is by the uh, Malia Mukopadhyay. Sorry if I mispronounced that. And it's, can any prediction from modified gravity theory be tested in a lab or has already been tested? So many of them have been tested and modified gravity fails. And also, you know, even the lab, if your lab extends to the orbit of Neptune, you know, we, we, or even where, wherever Pioneer is now and, um, and, and Voyager, they're testing gravity very precisely even out there. So at some level, those, they place very strong constraints on modified theories of gravity already. The kind of models I was talking about, this fifth force type chameleon model, which I mentioned earlier, those, yes, you can actually, and they're, they're because this, the, a quite a natural way for that force to operate is that at, at LHC type energies, <coughs> excuse me, it modifies gravity at, at atomic scales, <coughs> excuse me, where we have quite weak constraints on gravity, at, 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 atomic and subatomic scales. Um, we have very strong constraints up from a few grams up to the masses of stars. And then obviously, once you get beyond the galaxy, that's where the dark matter problems start. So there are actually atomic physics um, desktop type experiments that can place meaningful constraints on some of these models, yes. And they're very interesting. In fact, they're part of the this quantum metrology um, activity that in the answer to Matt Raymond's question that I brought up that some of them are actually doing that. All right, thank you so much, Professor Butterworth. And this was really a great start for our conference. So th thank you so much. Thanks uh, for all the um, questions. I'll try and follow up on, on um, Slack if I can with any with, with other stuff. Yeah, if, thank if you so want. much. And now we'll have a 10 minutes break. So uh, please for for everyone be back in 10 minutes at 35 past. And we'll have Dr. Paladino for a talk on the seat of the dark. So of course, during the break, you're welcome to stay in the Zoom call and to discuss on here or on Slack as well, if you want to discuss on there. 
you are entirely free to do whatever you please. So I will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you so much once again, Professor Butterworth. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.